Mothers at Port Moresby General receive gifts. I want to thank them and appreciate them. 17 prison escapees killed in Ley. And 750 people flee volcanic Manam Island. This is National MTV News with Neville Choi. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Sunday's news. It is Mother's Day and for mothers at the Port Moresby General Hospital, they were given their gifts yesterday. Corporate companies in partnership with NGO Susu Mamas gave away gift hampers to mums at the hospital. The NGO group wishes all mums a happy Mother's Day today. Yesterday, Susu Mamas Inc., its corporate partners, gave presents to mums at the Port Moresby General Hospital. For Mother's Day, it did something different. And we do this event annually, and we want to appreciate the mothers here. We do a lot of, go through a lot of difficult time, given the local situation that we are in. So we want to thank them and appreciate them. Susu Mamas began 40 years ago providing support to nursing mothers. Today it's grown across several centers including Ley and Port Moresby. It's headquarters in Mount Hagen, Western Highlands Province. Um, particularly we'd like to thank uh, KK Kingston, uh, True Kai, Coral Seas Hotels, Goodman Fielder, Cola, Airways Hotel and Paradise Foods and also Chris Elphick and his team who have been um, consistent sponsors every year for this event and it's something that the mothers really appreciate. The NGO provides medical help for the sick, assessment of nutritional levels of children under five, vaccinations and antenatal care. About 120,000 people use facilities across the country, a jump from 40,000 in 2012. The NGO has grown in partnership with the Australian Foreign Affairs and Trade Department, Steamships Trading Company and Puma Energy. Bethany Harriman, National MTV News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has extended his best wishes and called for prayers for mothers around the country today on Mother's Day. PM O'Neill said the day is another time to highlight the need for greater community action to empower women and girls and to take a stand against gender-based violence. The Prime Minister called for all men to reflect on the treatment of women in our communities. He maintained that education of girls will remain a priority for the PNC-led government. Villagers on Manam Island were warned to evacuate following the prediction of an eruption from the Rabaul Volcano Observatory. The Medang Disaster Director says his office was advised to move the villages to the mainland of Bogia last week. At least 750 people from the five villages at the base of the volcano were moved to care centers at Bogia. Five villages located along this coastline are under threat of being destroyed if the volcano continues to throw out rocks and lava. It has been degraded down to uh, stage two. Uh, I'm yet to receive today's uh, bulletin as and come, so at the moment it is still steady with stage two. The threat level on Manam was at stage 3, but that's been downgraded to stage 2. Disaster officials say it is still difficult to predict volcanic behavior at this time. A stage 2 alert indicates that the volcano could erupt again within weeks or months. But it doesn't mean that uh, the other, other communities won't be ev evacuated because um, it's the life that is uh, it's a paramount that uh, we will have to look into to get them out if the volcano is that serious. If it uh, upgraded to stage three and onwards, uh, we, we need to uh, make a, a massive uh, evacuation to get them out of the island. For now, the number of families living at the care centers has increased to at least 4,000. The number includes those who were evacuated in the 1996 and 2004 eruptions and those 750 moved last week. The community yet that in most of the companies. But the line of the house and property is not going to be able to do it. National MTV News, Manam. Still in Medang, at least 4,000 families living at the care centers in Bogia say life there is becoming an endless struggle for them since they were moved there in 2004. One of the women living at Potsdam Care Center, Grace Yali, told MTV most families turn to informal businesses to help sustain their livelihood. Others were focused to go back to Manam to get food supplies. 
Mother of four children, Grace Yali, says he was among those who were evacuated during the 1996 volcanic eruptions to the Kes centers on the mainland of Bogia district. It's been 21 years since they moved to the Kes center. She said life is a constant struggle for them. They say food, water and proper shelter is very difficult. An elder village chief says landowner of the land the Kes centers are sitting on has warned them not to use their land. Yeah, me got thinking of some syndrome from me like sense. Me must kiss him kappa or this black and something by me sit down with. Now me walk up in him bomb bomb, now me pluck him divide long back mountain and tap ya. All papa ground light him past Lomina, all he thought of him. So I was me kiss him divide all by coating me, now me give him uh, 1,000 money. Now you know what? Then I'll cut up with him six months. The project is currently managed and coordinated by the provincial government and the administration. So far, so far the uh, provincial government has already spent 26,000. Uh, just for the food relief supplies alone, uh, which is one off, which is one off. Uh, so to keep them, you know, keep them in the care center, it will uh, cost the, uh, the provincial government uh, well over, I think it's half a million or even a million to keep them here. Matalowicz, uh, National MTV News, Manam. Moving to Lane now, separate sources from the Correctional Service and police have stated that the number of prisoners shot dead during a prison breakout on Friday stands at 17. Figures provided by the sources state that more than 70 escaped on Friday. 16 were killed at the time of the escape, while one died of his injuries later. This is the second such escape in three years with disastrous consequences. Early Friday night, the bodies of the prisoners were taken to Angao General Hospital Morgue. Buimo Prison Command hasn't released a statement as yet, but that's always been the case in instances where prisoners have escaped in the past. However, separate sources from the CS and police have confirmed that 16 people were shot dead. One died of his injuries when he was brought into hospital. These are old pictures of the prison compound. The escape is likely to have occurred here where the bulk of prisoners are held. If you remember from previous coverage on MTV, there have been several investigations into previous prison escapes. The investigations have all repeated the same concerns. Those on the top of the list are overcrowding, poor sanitary conditions, and the frustration caused by the long waiting periods for prisoners on remand. Despite those concerns, there has been virtually no political or administrative will to resolve the root causes of the escapes. The CS command in both Ley and Port Mosby continue to admit that there are serious funding shortages and those funding shortages have contributed to food shortages, not just in Ley, but in jails throughout the country. Meanwhile, the police metropolitan command has issued a statement to Ley residents urging them to be vigilant over the next few weeks. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Ley. And in news just in, the police metropolitan commander in Ley, Anthony Wagambi Jr., has confirmed that 77 prisoners escaped on Friday. Three were recaptured and 17 were killed. 57 are still at large. That adds to others from other breakouts who have not been recaptured. Wagambi has issued a warning to relatives of prisoners to hand them over to police. There is a great tendency of counterfeit or illegal tender banknotes in circulation in the country. Central Bank Governor Loy Bakani says the public must be aware as large sums of money will be used during the national elections. Bakani made this statement following the hijacking of paper banknotes sent to Europe for recycling. According to the head of Central Bank, the paper banknotes were hijacked while on its way to Europe. It was repacked and sent back to the country, but was identified by BPNG authorities. Governor Bakani says there is evidence of an Asian country involved, but the bank is yet to confirm this. It's uh, money that went to Europe and it got uh, hijacked. Now, we got evidence that it is coming from um, Asia region. Uh, I won't say any particular country, but it's all coming coming back from those uh, that part of the world. Um, we got some already. We did not uh, um, give them any value for it. 
BPNG authorities have again warned the public not to accept any paper money as its legal tender ceased on 30th June 2012. It doesn't have any value. It shouldn't be used by the public to transact for that matter uh, because it's not real money. It's not uh, genuine money. And with the hype of the national elections, more money will be used by candidates and supporters. The bank believes some of the counterfeit or illegal banknotes are already in circulation and must be reported. Um, I know when in the election times, there's always a, a, a circulation of money goes uh, uh, very fast, meaning that uh, a lot of money is thrown around to, for uh, supporters to buy, uh, to access uh, goods and services. In other related matter, BPNG has announced the circulation of the new resized 5 kina banknote, effective 3rd of January 2017. Resizing of 100 kina, 50 kina and 2 kina banknotes will be made in 2017 and 2018, which will complete the series of banknote reforms. While banknotes continue to be reformed, Bakani is urging the public to report illegal banknotes in circulation. Uh, we hope that uh, um, our people can be alerted about this, uh, make sure that if they see or get hold of any of this money, they shouldn't accept it. They always should check the serial numbers. Uh, everybody in the trade stores or uh, schools or uh, for that matter should have these numbers, this range of uh, serial numbers. Jack LaPava, Jr., National MTV News. The Pacific International Hospital in Port Moresby today celebrated its second anniversary for successfully delivering health services in two full terms. CEO Dr. Carl Sandeep Shaligram said the hospital is looking forward to prevent, providing more health benefits and saving lives of Papua New Guineans. He said PIH is a one-stop shop for Papua New Guineans to access similar medical services that are provided overseas. It was only two years ago when PIH opened a completely brand new hospital in Three Mile. Today it celebrated the marking of its dedicated tertiary health services to the people of Papua New Guinea. Special guest His Excellency High Commissioner of Solomon Islands Barnabas Anga was given an official tour of the hospital by PIH CEO Dr. Cole Sandeep Shaligram. The tour started at the reception before going through the emergency ward, labor ward, surgery unit and others. Sure, PIH started as a diagnostic center way back in 1997 and uh, from a small diagnostic center which uh, at even at that point of time brought in cutting edge technology the first CT scan machine was brought in by PIH then and it developed into a minor surgery center later and uh, we established a hospital which was at four mile this hospital catered for a lot of niche services which were otherwise not available in PNG it catered for 24 hours medical care, emergency care, which was not available generally anywhere else. Dr. Shaligram said over the last two years, PIH have saved lives through the support of using world-class operating machines and quality support staff. PIH Director Dr. Shurez Venkita said PIH is one-stop shop for individuals and families requiring medical assistance, not just in PNG, but throughout the Pacific region. So our aim is to make sure that everyone who walks in to clinics below or to a hospital here or to sister hospitals coming up across the country are immediately met by a team who will handhold them right through the entire hospital stay process for the inpatient or outpatient so that when they leave they feel that their time and money was well spent and their health was taken care of and the best possible in PNG is offered to them at affordable cost. His Excellency Barnabas Anga said after the tour, a partnership will be created with PIH in PNG to also help the patients in Solomon Islands. I'd just like to mention that uh, we have uh, cases which sometimes we refer them, but because of the time and because of the process, uh, we do not have the outcome as we expected. So now that we have an offer here from uh, PIH, we can always consider uh, referring some of our candidates uh, to PIH and obviously we know that the travel arrangements are more frequent here. CEO Dr. Sandeep said PIH has come a long way, feeding off its success to the point where it is now saving lives of Papua New Guineans at a cost-effective price while getting the best services possible, which is of international standards. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. 
You're with National MTV News. After the break, more on election campaigns and stories from the autonomous region of Bougainville. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. As campaign progresses into its third week, the focus of campaign strategies has pretty much turned to the type of policies candidates are pushing or attacking. Today, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill described recent policies announced by the opposition as reckless. In a statement, the PM said the opposition's plan to cut back direct funding to districts and end free education will lead the country backwards. Mr. O'Neill said the outcome of the election of the next parliament of Papua New Guinea is in the hands of every eligible voter in the country. Over 3,000 security personnel will be conducting security operations for the national elections in the New Guinea Islands region. It will be a joint operation between the PNG Defense Force and Correctional Services with police leading the operation. The operation was officially launched in Lorangau Town, Manus Province. A parade consisting of three companies from the police, PNGDF and Correctional Services was hosted to mark the launch. The parade shows the joint effort all three disciplinary forces are putting in ensuring a safe and secure election. Despite the rain, a general salute was given to the police commissioner, Gary Barkey, who was the reviewing officer. The commissioner was later invited to review the parade before addressing the security personnel. The commissioner and the person responsible for talking to the government to adjust funding to support us in the elections, that is my responsibility. You have a responsibility and your responsibility is to provide the environment safe for our men, all of the population going to be logged on a casting vote long. I ask for nothing more than your total dedication, commitment and loyalty. Parade host and Manoj Provincial Police Commander, Senior Inspector David Yapu, highlighted the focus of the operations and encouraged his men and women to remain neutral when conducting the operation. This marks a very important and significant Occasion for the people of Manus to witness the launching of New Guinea Island 2017 National Election Security Operations at your hometown at Lorangau, Manus Province. The PNG Defence Force and the Correctional Services stands ready to assist police in conducting the security operations for the NGI region. They will be providing naval and logistic support and additional manpower. The security operations will run until the declaration of the elected members. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. Former Medang Governor Sir Arnold Ahmet is confident of winning the Sumka open seat in this national election. The former Chief Justice is up against 46 nominated candidates, including the sitting Member of Parliament, Ken Fairweather. Sir Arnold Ahmet is contesting under the National Alliance Party banner. Sir Anol was the governor for Medang in the Somara government and a member of parliament from 2007 to 2012. Really we're about serious business to run the country. Like I said, uh, there are serious issues. So I'm not just running to be an uh, open member and just run the DDA. I'm contesting to get back into government to be a senior minister in senior leadership to uh, assist in running the country. High on the list of priorities is education. Se Anul is promising improvements in the education system. He is one of 3,000 candidates also promising better education and higher intakes. All of us know. So I intend to fight vigorously to increase the opportunity for every Sumkar and every Madang and every Papua New Guinean child. They have the right to go on to the highest level possible. And that's grade 12. So you can have an opportunity to go into tertiary education, just like I and many others have had. 
so like those are other of national the alliance candidates, he is also echoing calls for an increase in LLG funding, saying the current allocation of 100,000 kina is inadequate for development needs of the LLGs. Also present at the gathering was James Yali, the former Medin governor. Yali was convicted for rape but has been allowed by the Electoral Commission whilst on parole. He is up against 31 nominated candidates. On Wednesday, Yali put out an open invitation to all the nominated candidates in the six districts to witness the launch of his posters and the start of his election campaign. The Constitution allows every citizen of Sound Mine and not in prison for more than nine months to contest. I have been out on parole since 2010 February. I am I'm not in prison. That means I am free to do all other things except to abide by the parole uh, terms and conditions. Matalubis, National and MTV News, Bogia. Former Kairuku Hiri MP Paro Aihi launched his election campaign yesterday in Hisu, Central Province. Aihi will run under the People's National Congress banner and is confident he will retain the seat he lost to sitting MP Peter Isoaimo in a by-election in 2014. Aihi is one of 27 who will contest the Kairuku Hiri seat. <laughs> Supporters stand up in numbers to witness the launch of Mr. Ai's election campaign. This is his fourth time to contest the Kairuku Hiri seat. Ai was elected in 2007 after he beat long-term MP Se Moi Ave. He then went on to win the 2012 elections. However, he lost a seat after a court ordered by election following allegations of election bribery. Yesterday, he made known his intentions to why he is contesting again this year. I know the interest of all these other villages in Karukuhiri. I know their issues. We won't deal with that today, but I tell you this. I am the best chance you have. I will run under the PNC banner, and he believes the only led government is here to stay. However, he says the nation deserves principal leaders and foundations must be set for future generations. It is about the future generation. I want to give this my last shot. I am appealing to you to help me get back in there. I will stay in parliament as long as you keep me there. But we are going to have to lay down very solid foundations for the future generation. I is one of 27 who will contest the Kairuku Hiri seat. Stanley Ove Jr., National MTV News. Meanwhile, sitting member for Kairuku Hiri, Peter Isoaimo, came with a clear message at Porabada for people to vote him back for the next five years to complete projects he has initiated. With 27 other candidates running for the same seat, he urged the people to vote responsibly. Isawaima was followed by a convoy for his campaign rally at Parabada Village yesterday. Kairukuhiri Peter Isawaima was given a traditional welcome after a 20-minute convoy into Parabada Village. He walked through the village to meet village leaders and district members of the Kairukuhiri LLGs before making his speech. I have never discriminated against any other people who supported me or not. I open-heartedly gave to everybody so long as you are from Kairukuhiri and so long as you approach my office and ask, I give. Speaking to a population of nearly 9,000, the National Alliance Party member said the aim of the party is to improve and provide service delivery. While the people of Poribada have struggled with water problems for years, he said providing water services into the village will be one of the many priorities for Poribada village. He said while service delivery into Kairukuhiri is only limited despite being in charge of a large electorate that has a population of over 100,000 plus, funding has always been an issue. You voted on me only to be custodian of your financial resources, your money. That's why I gave without fear or favor or any discrimination. 
Isuaimo said while he stands to provide better health and education under the National Alliance Party, he has saved everyone, not just in his electorate, but others as well. Isuaimo said one of the main focus is that whoever will be nominated to run in the next five years must put the interest of the people first. He said he is comfortable providing that there is a clean and fair election. <laughs> Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Fighting factions in the autonomous region of Bougainville have signed an understanding to work together to pursue peace by all means, leading to the Bougainville referendum in 2019. They include the former Bougainville Revolutionary Army, or BRA, Mekamui Government of Unity, the Twin Kingdom factions, and the Mekamui Defense Force. It was also a commitment to resolve issues which arose from the Rore Nyang coup and further commit themselves to work in partnership with the autonomous Bougainville government in moving the process forward. The parties agreed between May 15th to 15th they will reconcile with ceremonies to be held at Rorinang, Panguna and Arawa. Still in Bougainville, the party leader and opposition leader, Don Pollier, says economically empowering the people of the autonomous region of Bougainville is the way forward to build capacity. Mr. Paulier says Bougainvillians must be left alone to decide their future referendum, but with support of the national government. With the region having potential in agriculture and tourism, the national government's job is to empower them. Among the agricultural potential is the untapped biofuel sector. There are other sectors that can generate revenue for the autonomous Bougainville government to run its own affairs. Paulier is confident these issues can be addressed holistically. You're with National MTV News. After the break, we go to news making headlines overseas, updates from Afghanistan, and cyber attacks. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. In the U.S., President Donald Trump is considering sending thousands more troops to America's longest war. CNN's Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr reports the surge is part of an overall review of strategy in Afghanistan. President Trump is about to decide on a Pentagon plan for beefing up the U.S. fight against the Taliban and ISIS in Afghanistan. The first option, sending as many as 5,000 additional U.S. troops to bolster the 8,400 already there. The goal is to pressure the Taliban to the negotiating table. Candidate Trump initially opposed sending more troops, but later acknowledged the need for a military presence. Do I love anything about it? No. I, I like, I think it's important that we, number one, keep a presence there and ideally, you know, a presence of pretty much what they're talking about, 5,000 soldiers. But are more troops the only answer from the president? One of the things that he has asked his national security team to do is to actually think the stra rethink the strategy. How do we actually, um, how do we win? How do we eliminate the threat? He has to square the circle between no more nation building, reducing America's footprint abroad, and his pledge to go after bad guys. Defense Secretary James Madison says progress is being made. In Afghanistan, we're up against a determined enemy. Uh, as I said, ISIS has been thrown back there. Uh, Al-Qaeda has been unable to amount attacks out of Afghanistan. After U.S. troop levels rose to 100,000 in mid-2010, President Obama set a plan to reduce the U.S. effort. With the Taliban now back on the rise, commanders want Trump to also approve authority to conduct more airstrikes and ground operations. What we need to watch for and be careful about is if 10,000 becomes 20,000, 20,000 becomes 30,000. We've been there since 2000. One, that's 15 plus years, not a lot to show for it. President Trump already has given more authority to commanders overseeing operations in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Somalia. The decision to launch the Moab bomb for the first time was made by the general on the ground. But it is U.S. Special Operations Forces that have suffered casualties in repeated counterterrorism operations, a total of 12 killed in combat in the last year. A warning from the top commander. We're not a panacea. We are not the, the ultimate solution for every problem, and, and you will not hear that coming from us. 
one of the big jobs for U.S. forces will be to train and advise Afghan forces to get them better equipped to deal with the threats they face. There's no indication of how soon President Trump may make a decision on how many more U.S. troops to send. He is hoping that NATO will also send some additional troops. Well, he might be retiring from public life, but Prince Philip is still in lively form. The prince was interviewed for American television while out carriage driving, showing he still has his trademark looks. Carriage driving when he gave up polo. It's a favorite sport. So too is winding up unwary interviewers. As an American carriage driver, interviewing the Duke for US television discovered this afternoon. So, a gentle first question. What does it mean to you to have the, the sport that you helped develop displayed here at Windsor? Uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, how about some reminiscences? I, I heard a wonderful story once how you came back with only three wheels and needed a garden stake to sort of prop up. No, that wasn't me. Oh, good. <laughs> so it was somebody else. Maybe a more technical question about the competitions would work. What was your personal favourite phase of the, of the three days? I didn't have a favourite. <laughs> we just had to get through them. <laughs> Oh, please, there must be something you'd like to share. Do you have some favorite experiences that you'd like to favorite? share? Favorite? Favorite, like a... <laughs> like turning over. To... <laughs> that, that was your favorite? <laughs> well, no, but I don't know what you mean by experiences. Um, some um, special memories you have of, of your years in competing in the sport. Is there something that stands out for you that you look back fondly and said, yeah, that was a... They were turning over here in the, in the water. <laughs> and there we have it. He's nearly 96. Soon he'll be taking life easier. We'll miss him. Yesterday, more than 100,000 computer systems froze and businesses around the world came to a standstill after the biggest cyber attack in history. New Zealand fortunately appears to be one of the countries that escaped the global ransom cyberware attack. Local cybersecurity officials, however, say they will be staying vigilant with the working week starting tomorrow. Sin is the first to admit she isn't tech savvy, but she noticed something strange about three emails she received on Friday from women she didn't know. I would heard about the virus thing that was going around and I thought, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I'm not going to open them anyway. As yet, cybercrime agency CERT says there have been no reports that the international ransomware attack has made it to New Zealand. The time zones have certainly worked in our favour um, and that has uh, allowed us to um, have a little grace period while the world works out what's going on um, before uh, our business day starts tomorrow. It's been 48 hours since hackers effectively took hostage more than 100,000 computer systems across five continents. The damage was contained when a British computer programmer who wants to remain anonymous stumbled onto a kind of kill switch. This is something I sort of did in my free time. I was a little surprised it wasn't as sophisticated as I expected. I was expecting proper professional grade code. Many of Britain's hospitals and GP services brought to a standstill are almost back to normal. The focus now is to catch the hackers. We haven't identified the offenders at this moment in time, but we are deploying all covert and overt means available to us, and we have a number of lines of inquiry. Authorities are warning that hackers may launch a second, more sophisticated wave of cyber attacks. So we are analysing those reports as well. The advice remains the same for users. Make sure you have backed up your data and installed the latest patches and security settings. And like Carol Anderson, be wary of what you click. It is six months today since the magnitude 7.8 earthquake rocked Kaikoura in New Zealand. Two lives were lost and the earthquake changed the landscape and livelihoods of many. Six months since the early morning quake claimed two lives, countless buildings, roads, mountainsides and livelihoods. But the town of Kaikoura's remained resilient. There's a real strong sense of pride at the fact that we've made it through this event. We're stronger and 
and we're closer, we're tight. But the town that relies on the tourism dollar is far from out of the woods. State Highway 1 north of the town won't reopen until Christmas, while the State Highway south of the town is also temporarily blocked due to the recent cyclones. That should reopen by the end of the month. A longer alternative route inland is available. We've had to learn to adapt to having just one alternative route open, which is better than no alternative route, but it, yeah, it's been very, very difficult. Government aid packages have been dished out, but some are worried by the onset of winter. We're struggling now because we're back into the winter again, and we're only around the 40 to 50 per cent visitor. Those that are really focused on the tourists that are staying there and dining and buying in the retail, they are the ones that are hurting. It's a bit unknown what's ahead of us. We really, you know, we're hanging our hat on that a summer next year. The government says the total cost of the Kaikoura quakes is expected to be in the order of two to three billion dollars. But all in all, the locals say their town is surviving. It's amazing how these sort of things bring people together. And my faith in human nature has been restored. It's you're with National MTV News, local and overseas sports news when we come back. Cricket PNG boasts a successful year and rugby union, the Crusaders, shut down the Hurricanes. Stay with us. Two Kai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. In 2016 alone, Cricket PNG boasted a successful year with great performances from the national teams and its development programs countrywide. And the achievements did not go unnoticed. Baramandi skipper Asad Vala and the Empowering Girls Through Cricket program have been nominated in three categories for the SB Sports Awards 2017. The Hebo PNG Baramandis were nominated alongside SP PNG Hunters and the PNG Men's National Football Team. The Baramandis are currently ranked second to Netherlands in the World Cricket League Championship and fourth in the Intercontinental Cup. Top in the region and always striving for the best in both competitions, the Baras are ahead of the likes of Namibia and Kenya. Even in the South Australia Cricket Association Premier League, they finished off third in the competition in 2016. Now hot on the heels of Netherlands for the top sport in the World Cricket League Championship, winning or finishing in the top four would mean maintaining their ODI status as well as a World Cup qualifying sport. And the SP Sports Awards nomination for the Team of the Year comes as the Barras are months away from sealing the deal in the WCLC. Meanwhile, the captain Asad Vala was also nominated in the Male Athlete of the Year category award. Though he is a fair bit of competition from Moria Baru in weightlifting and rugby league's Justin Olam. Vala, who secured himself three centuries in the Intercontinental Cup competition between 2015 and 2016 and leading his team to two victories over Namibia and Kenya on home soil, is the leading batsman in the region at the moment. Though it is not the first time he is making waves, he was awarded the SP Sports Award Male Athlete of the Year in 2013. Now four years on and being nominated again only goes to show his remarkable leadership in the Baramandi's team and a batsman PNG opponents don't take lightly. And to give Cricket PNG more reason to celebrate a successful 2016, the Girls Empowerment Program through Cricket Program has also been nominated for the Community Initiative of the Year Award. Targeting secondary school girls, the program strives to increase female participation in hardball cricket while empowering them through educational sessions on social and health awareness. Dina Ross Rico, National MTV Sports. To Athletics and the NCD Athletics Association is hosting its fortnightly preseason competition. Despite the absence of sprint stars Kupun Whistle and Nelson Stone, organizers are hopeful the new athletes will one day represent Papua New Guinea. Pace may not have been blistering, the preseason meet for one of the biggest athletics association in PNG is slowly beginning to set the foundation for a big 2017 season. Featuring a small number of athletes in a number of events, the association is looking to boost their numbers through the year. Yeah, we hope to uh, get some uh, kids from the NCD um, Secondary Schools uh, Athletics um, yeah, Carnival. My dad won't have the um, competition yet. Maybe I think it's around uh, June, July that they'll be having the 
uh, carnival. John Gutierrez from the association says some of their runners will take part in the upcoming PNG Games in Kimbe this November. Uh, the guys that you are seeing in there, some uh, athletes from Central Province who are also uh, uh, training with us and competing with in the Port Moresby Athletic Association. And uh, we've got a good lot of uh, young uh, kids who we are nurturing to participate at the Kimber Games. Apart from the open divisions, there was also the opportunity for younger sprinters to line up. Apart from the 100-meter race, other events included the 800 and long jump. When queried about the field events, such as the javelin and shot put, they were unable to comment. A number of PNG's best runners have come through the ranks, taking part in these meets. And it is only a matter of time before the next crop of talent is ready to be showcased. Jeremy Mogi, National TV Sports. In Super Rugby, the Crusaders shut down the Hurricanes, beating the defending champions 20 points to 12. Leading by their tight five players, the Crusaders have a confirmed top position on the Super Table. If you thought forward set-piece domination was slipping as a key to winning rugby, think again. Huge scrum. The Crusaders did a number on the Hurricanes 8 with physical and mental pressure. The belief that if we, you know, play that brand of footy, that, um, you know, we can do anything. That belief held firm early on as both defensive lines were tested. Now Marpy breaking through. Each line break, though, was met with scrambling Crusaders' resolve and some cheeky medicine of their own for the Hurricanes. Wide cross kick coming up here. And it's straight into the arms of Bridge. The Crusaders hit the top attacking team with the unexpected, as well as handling setbacks, losing lock Scott Barrett to an ankle injury. Locked up with penalty kicks, Matt Todd led the forwards charge again. Balls at the front. Now here come the Crusaders. This is looking good. Good enough for match officials to eventually rule a try to Todd as that Crusaders forward strength told once more for the only try. The Barretts were kept quiet on a slippery evening. The Canes trailers with just four penalties. They were forced into errors. When the home side lost one of their inspirational forwards to a head knock, they didn't flinch. Likewise, when the desperate Hurricanes threw everything into late lineouts. Jordy Barrett wins the lineout. How about that? On the back of the pack, the Crusaders team performance wound back the red and black clock to title winning day. Yeah, we didn't let them get anything going off set piece, which is a massive credit to our front row and the top four. The Crusaders 20 to 12 sending out another clear message. They have three local derbies in their four remaining games, including a rematch against the Canes. But it's going to take a huge response to knock them over. Still in Super Rugby and a strong performance for the Highlanders. They scored their seventh win in a row, squeaking home again in South Africa, this time against the Bulls. Rain and a near empty Loftus Versfeld. The match saw 90 kicks in general play, the best one coming from the Highlanders' second five. Buckman with the little chip over the top, that's a nasty one. And Matt Fallis grabs it with one hand and opens the scoring for the Highlanders. Two late red cards marred the game, both for shoulder charges. The first against All Blacks and Highlanders wing Waisaki Naholo. The second handed out to Bulls lock R.G. Snayman for a shoulder charge in this ruck. The Highlanders, though, held their nerve. Here's Banks getting away to Walden. Oh, look at the pace from Malachi Fekitoa. Suddenly he's clear and he's under the sticks. Malachi Fekitoa. The Highlanders 17-10 in the end. They head to the warmer climbs of Perth next weekend. You're watching True Kai Sports. Don't go away. We've got some more stories coming up after the break. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. In the NRL, the Warriors' second half meltdown has been labelled as one of the worst in the club's 22 year history. Some fans even took to social media last night, while at the same time, an unwanted warrior was lighting up Brisbane. Dummy may have been obstruction almost there. Twelve months ago, Conrad Hurrell couldn't even crack a spot on the bench of a dreadful Warriors outfit. Does he get the ball down? Oh. Today, he's in the form of his life, 
with surprise, surprise, another NRL team. Blow misses her a kiss back in Tonga. She's watching. But if you thought that effort was good, check out his next one. With what would be the match winner. The Titans pulling out two tries in the final seven minutes to beat the Storm 38 points to 36. The Storm tying an NRL record for most points scored in a loss. Next week, we defend like we did this week, there'll be changes. I don't care where they're coming from. Comebacks becoming a bit of a theme last night, with the Seagulls giving up an early 14-point lead to be run down by the Broncos in the second half. Yeah, it's a big win for the Broncos. But no matter how good both of those efforts were, nothing really comes close to the Warriors' meltdown in Penrith. But Wunga Blake goes straight over the top of him. What does it say to you that the Warriors have only won seven matches in Australia in the last three years? Oh, what a match. It's not easy. That's what it says, it's not easy. But if they want to be successful, they have to get their head around it and deal with it. Uh, the Warriors languishing in 12th place on the NRL ladder. Their talk of becoming a top four side now looking laughable. They somehow have to get it through their head that they have to travel and they've got to be good at it. Things are only getting tougher. Top four side, the Dragons heading to Hamilton in just five days' time. And that's a wrap for Chukai Sports this Sunday. Up next, your weather details. True Kai Sports. And the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in this southern region only. Port Moresby, partly cloudy, moderate southeasterly winds, fine and windy for Daru, partly cloudy in Kerma, mostly fine in Alatau, and fine and partly cloudy in Popaneta. And that's the way it is this Sunday, the 14th of May, 2017. From all of us here at MTV, we would like to wish all the mothers out there a blessed Mother's Happy Mother's Day and have a safe working week and enjoy the rest of tonight's viewing. Good night.